For those who may be unfamiliar, this is Greg Locke. He is a far-right extremist hate preacher who's always talking about how witches are trying to infiltrate his church. Dead serious. Listen to what he has to say. This one is from August 14th, 2022. Listen to this. I get these preachers all the time. They're like, well, my goodness, we believe in standing for the gospel, but we never had this stuff happen in our church that you talk about having in your church. How come you got demons started? How, witches are coming to your church? Well, they don't come to my church. That's because your church ain't a threat to them. That's why. That's Nicely justified. Okay, I don't think witches are coming to his church constantly, but he, the dude believes that witches are infiltrating his, his church so much that he's had to come up with explanations for why so many witches are constantly infiltrating the church. Ridiculous. That's because your church is yoked up with them. You church praying some of the same voodoo prayers the rest of them wicked people are praying. No wonder your church ain't stirred up by a bunch of witches. I'm telling you, when deliverance hits the house and demons start getting stirred up and the fire gets cranked up, them serpents start coming out. So, yeah, that's Greg Locke. Uh, well, as it turns out, he wrote a book. The title of the book is This Means War, We Will Not Surrender Through Silence. Okay, now, this is chapter 7. If you haven't seen the other parts, don't sweat it. You don't have to see the others to understand what's happening here. I will provide context if it's missing. So with all that being said, let's read chapter 7 of this dude's book. Title is The Bible Says. See what he has to say for himself here. It's time to wake up, church. It's time to push back as scripture teaches us as the Holy Spirit leads. The first century church faced far greater persecution when all three worldly forces of their day, the Roman Empire, the local governments, and the local religious leaders, worked in unison to shut them up in an effort to erase Jesus from the culture. Sound familiar? Actually, I think that there were a bunch of religious cults that were, like, rising up out of the woodwork around the time. For example, I believe the Pharisees were kind of a religious cult at the time, in, in Bible times, right? And Jesus was just another supposed Messiah that came along. He was just another one. You know, there were like a billion. And the Roman Empire and, and local governments and many others were trying to tamp down on these religious cults that continued to appear out of the woodwork. Yeah, I mean, I guess they were kind of persecuting them at the time. I don't stand for religious persecution of any sort. I don't stand for people tamping down on religious freedom, as was happening here. But you know what? America has a lot of religious freedom. There is a lot of religious freedom here, a lot more than there was back then. I mean, that's why they supposedly killed Jesus in the first place, right? It was because there was no religious freedom. Guy is also obsessed with being persecuted. I don't know if you noticed. He thinks he's one of the most persecuted people alive, where in reality, he honestly has no idea what persecution is. No idea. Read the book of Acts to see how they responded and compare the courageous acts of Peter and John and Paul and Priscilla and all other builders of the Christian church to the words and actions we're witnessing from most church leaders today. There's virtually no likeness and it's heartbreaking. At this point, the church is walking in gross disobedience to the truth of scripture. That may sound like provocative rhetoric, but it's sadly factual. So he's saying... There's no likeness between what the church was in Bible times versus what it is today. I disagree. There are a lot of commonalities between the two. Aside from that, the church was in the process of being formed out in Bible times. It wasn't completely formed out yet back then. So naturally, there are going to be some differences. But either way, you know, I, I think it's a stupid point. Subheading is called Biblical Reasons Churches Must Open. Oh my God, he's still going on about COVID lockdowns. First of all, Donald Trump was in power during the writing and publishing of this book. His God Emperor. And second, there was a single, I believe, 30-day lockdown from the federal government. And any other lockdown of any sort was done by states. And third, the states didn't even do long lockdowns. Most of the hesitancy was just natural. It naturally arose from the fact that there was a pandemic spreading across the country. And businesses had to close their doors because they didn't have uh, enough employees because their employees were sick. The customers weren't coming in because they were too afraid of catching it. It was just cultural hesitancy that really caused businesses to close. It wasn't 
governments forcing it. But once again, Greg Locke needs this to be a point of persecution, Christian persecution. So the subheading is biblical reasons churches must open. By this point, they'd already opened again. Let me address seven points that prove that churches should disregard the mandates, open up their buildings, pastor their people, and march on in the power of gospel, okay? Number one, the power is in the gathering. Jesus intentionally proved this throughout his ministry, in his words and in his daily walk. He always made it perfectly clear that gathering crowds to hear his teachings was crucial to understanding his kingdom and to building fruitful relationships in the body of Christ. I don't know a true believer who doesn't hunger for church gatherings. It is our sanctuary, our healing place, our altar to cry on, our time to give back, our word of encouragement, our safe place for our kids to learn, our pool to be baptized, our sacred house of prayer, and above all, our place to love and worship the living God and feel his power the way Jesus taught us, as one, just as he and the Father are one. Interesting point. Okay, let me counter it with this point. I believe, correct me if I'm wrong here, doesn't the Bible say, where two or more gather, he is with them? Doesn't it say something to that effect? I'm pretty sure it does. So all this complaining about people not meeting. You've got to have these gigantic meetings. You've got to have 600 people come to the church and gather and all that. Nonsense. Unbiblical. Has nothing to do with what the Bible says. The Bible says where two or more are together. That means the families in the church could gather and it would have been biblical. And people who are single, don't have any kids or wives or husbands or whatever else, they can meet with one other person from the congregation and it would still be biblical. But none of that matters. It's all about how persecuted Greg Locke is. Few experiences rival being among the fellowship of believers while lifting our voices together to worship him. That's the power, and we desperately need it. Well, the Bible says you can get that power when two or more are gathered together talking about him. So, complete nonsense. You could both be in compliance with regulations and also in compliance with what the Bible wanted, but he didn't want that. He wanted to be in compliance with what the Bible said and also intentionally, specifically not be in compliance with what the government wanted. Just to be a head. That's really what it was all about. He just wanted to be a head about it. And if I asked him, I'm 99% sure he would just admit that. Jesus said he would be right here in the midst of us whenever and wherever we gather. Yeah, two or more, that's correct. Why would we ever re relinquish gathering where we know we can feel his tangible presence? I can't, and our people at Global Vision Bible Church can't. Jesus died to ensure we could live and love and worship our Father in heaven fearlessly with power from on high, just like the first century believers, dot, dot, dot. And then there's like italics. There's a little section in italics. I'm assuming it's a quote. Yeah, it's from Acts 2, 46 to 47. And as you guys know, I don't read his Bible quotes because one, I don't trust them. And for two, he uses King James. And I think the King James is a terrible translation. I use the NIV. It's much better. More accurate? Not necessarily. I think the NIV is just more readable by a modern audience. If you want more accurate, there are more accurate translations out there than NIV, but it's close enough. Acts 2, 46 to 47. Let's see here. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Okay? Let's not ever again relinquish the power to gather, for it is the power to save. Nobody ever told you you were not allowed to gather. Nobody ever relinquished that power. You were allowed to gather outside. You were allowed to gather inside with masks and social distancing. The government never told you not to do that. It was never about that. The government regulations, every state and on a federal level, all maintained biblical compliance through all of it. You were still allowed to gather, you just had to do it outside. And that only went on for 30 days or something. The guy is obsessed with twisting things out of proportion and being a victim. That's what it's all about for Greg. Number two, the local church is still the pillar and ground of the truth. All right, let's just see what he says about it. This is a simple biblical fact. The Apostle Paul wrote this simple truth in his second letter to Timothy, instructing how he should conduct himself in the house of God, which is the church of the living God, 
the pillar and ground of the truth. 2 Timothy 2.15. Wow, I love it. 2 Timothy 2.15. That's like three verses away from one of my favorite verses of all time. Not because I respect what it says, but because I don't respect what it says very specifically. And people love to ignore this verse. 2 Timothy 2.12. No, I'm sorry. I was thinking 1 Timothy 2.12, not 2 Timothy 2.12. 1 Timothy 2.12 says, A woman should learn in quietness and full submission. I do not permit a woman to teach or to assume authority over a man. She must be quiet. Uh, Once again, do not respect anything about that verse, but I tend to point it out a lot when I hear these prophetesses like Kat Kerr and Amanda Grace and others claiming to hear the voice of God and teaching others what God says and all that stuff. They're completely ignoring parts of the Bible, but focusing in like a laser on the parts that they like to read, like the parts about how gay people are evil and stuff like that. Just for good measure, there's I actually have three Bible verses that I can really appreciate. That's one of them. 1 Timothy 2.12, because it exposes hypocrisy within the church. Second verse that I really like is Deuteronomy 18.20, which basically talks about false prophets. Brought me a lot of comfort when leaving Jehovah's Witnesses. And three, my num- my third favorite verse is Galatians 5.3, I believe. Galatians 5.3. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. So if you are cut, then you have to follow the Old Testament laws, all 613 of them. No polyester, no putting two seeds in the same hole, no shellfish, no pork, the whole nine yards. And they completely ignore that. Pretend that verse isn't even in there because it's not convenient. Anyway, let's keep reading Greg Locke here. In the modern era, we have the tremendous blessing of Scripture being readily available in virtually every medium imaginable. But you're the persecuted one, right? We've got it all right at our fingertips, but this doesn't replace the critical role of the local church as the ground of truth. Scripture constantly reminds us that the local church is the necessary forum to end controversies, to settle conflicts, to rightly divide and understand the Scripture, to seek wise counsel, to search out the mystery of God with like-minded believers and to train up our children in the ways of the Lord while gathered with peers of their own. This is sounding a lot like Jehovah's Witnesses' view on it. It's not good. The sharing of truth in large gatherings is inspiring, and what's crazy is few of us were getting enough Bible truth before all this nonsense began. We definitely need private study, but scripture is clear about the need for public preaching of the word. All believers need direct access to well-trained teachers who take seriously their responsibility before God to ensure we are being fed the word in the house of God. Okay, yeah, sure, fair enough. I suppose I can see the point here. They do need access to teachers. That's why you should make yourself available to anybody who is inside protecting their friends and family from catching COVID. You should make yourself available to them. Call them up. Use Zoom. Hell, show up to their house. Talk to them. You can make yourself available to them specifically without gathering in a gigantic circus tent with no masks and no precautions whatsoever. He is desperately trying to twist this around to make it out like the Bible explicitly condemned lockdowns, like uh, COVID lockdowns, when in fact it did not. The government's COVID lockdowns were perfectly in line with what the Bible had to say. They could follow the Bible and follow the government lockdown simultaneously, but he really, really wants to feel persecuted. Sounds like he's succeeding. Jesus is still the only way, the only truth, and the only life, and still no one comes to the Father except through him. Uh, Was anybody arguing against that? If the local church isn't open, where do the lost go to talk to someone about Jesus? The liquor stores? Zoom? I mean, the phone exists. Number three, the closer we get to the coming of Jesus Christ, the more we are commanded to meet. Is this a quote? It is. This is a, a quote from the Bible again. Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. Let me take a look. Okay, here we go. This is Hebrews 10, 24 to 25. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Sure, sure, okay, fair enough. You know, that verse does apply here, except for the fact that the Bible says where two or more meet, he is with them. 
don't neglect meeting with at least one other person. Doesn't have to be a gigantic congregation. Doesn't have to be maskless. Bible says nothing about being maskless. As a matter of fact, it specifically instructs people to wear masks if they are sick. It instructs people to quarantine if they're sick. Leviticus 13.45. The person with such an infectious disease must wear torn clothes, let his hair be unkempt, Cover the lower part of his face and cry out, unclean, unclean. Huh. Cover the lower part of his face. How about that? Isn't that interesting? And Greg Locke completely ignores that part. Something else, man. Could it be put more plainly? Surely the day of his coming is drawing near. We can't neglect our gatherings, pastors, especially not in these days of lawlessness and Christian persecution. For a true believer, this is non-negotiable. In China, the Christians risk their very lives to fulfill this beautiful exhortation and countless innocent souls have been imprisoned or executed for their faith. That's true, actually. That's very true. Not good. Not good. I, I, I don't like how China treats religious people at all. It's really, really ugly. But... That word there, exhortation, that's another word that I only hear in religious contexts. Exhortation, obeisance, and humility are three words that I really only hear in a religious context. More on that later. We cannot surrender our right or our need to gather just because politicians and fear mongers betray the law of the land to command our submission. Again, nothing the government ordered was out of line with what the Bible said. It was all perfectly in line with it. Throughout the Gospels, we see Jesus commending those who meet when and where he calls them, no matter the cost, and we also see him condemning those who refuse. Yeah, if you're just being lazy and not showing up to church, that's one thing. If there's a good reason that you're holding service outside or on Zoom, that's completely different. He really, really desperately wants to be a victim here and make it out like the government was breaking biblical law when it absolutely simply wasn't. Don't miss that. Jesus often condemned or severely warned those who refused to become his disciple once he called them. The negligent wedding guests of Matthew 22 and the foolish virgins of Matthew 25 are examples. Both of these foreboding parables deal with the coming of Christ and both deal harshly with those who aren't ready when he calls them out. If we take Jesus at his word and if we take these teachings seriously, those who make a habit of neglecting the gathering of the saints are in danger of not being ready when he comes calling again for many are called but few are chosen says the lord so i guess this is like a list that he's laying down next is number four hell itself can't stop the church and it looks like number five is the world is in desperate need of hope okay this, this next subheading is hell itself can't stop the church number four Jesus famously told Peter that not even the gates of hell could prevail against his church. He also promised he would give us the keys to the kingdom of heaven and that he would empower our prayers regarding all things in heaven and earth. The church is his master plan. Jesus bestows this amazing promise specifically to the church so we can wage spiritual warfare. Wow, that's disturbing. I, I guess Locke's explicit stated goal is to wage spiritual warfare jehovah's witnesses have a word for that it's called theocratic warfare and it justifies them lying cheating manipulating stealing whatever to accomplish the goals of the congregation or of jehovah quote unquote of the governing body basically when i see theocratic warfare or spiritual warfare it raises red flags it's concerning as we've seen, we can't fully operate as the church if we don't gather, and we risk this supernatural covering if we fail to be the church. Every true believer who attends a living church recognizes that it's their sanctuary, not just from the troubles of the world, but from the forces of evil and darkness in the heavenly realm. Yes, Satan and his demons are very real, and they're on the move like never before, but neither he nor his minions nor his puppets in this world can prevail against the church of Jesus Christ. I thought he was going to say of Latter-day Saints for some reason. When we gather... We want this covering, we need this covering, and we refuse to surrender this covering no matter who acts as the devil's advocate. Does that include Donald Trump, I wonder? If Donald Trump acted as the devil's advocate, would that count? This church is dangerously close to worshiping Donald Trump in all seriousness, viewing him as a new messiah. It's weird. There's no mystery to why they want to shut us down while the darkness advances across the earth. If our local churches fail to function with the same commitment to unity and courage that Peter and the apostles demonstrated before laying down their lives, can we really expect to retain the power Jesus promised solely to the church that was built on this rock? 
My God, dude, this guy is obsessed with going on and on and on about how persecuted he is by the government, as if the government cares about his tiny little church, as if anybody does, aside from the fact that he's an extremist. If he wasn't an extremist, people wouldn't pay any attention to him. But he believes that being an extremist is like a precursor to being accepted by Jesus. It's nuts, dude. It's nuts. I don't see how anyone would risk such a promise at a time such as this. Okay, number five, the world is in desperate need of hope. What are we even counting here? Um, hang on. Oh, these are supposed to be the seven points that prove that churches should disregard the mandates, open up their buildings, pastor their people, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Right. The world is in desperate need of hope. I don't know what this has to do with opening churches up after lockdowns or whatever. Let's be honest about this. From the days Jesus walked this earth to today, our faith and hope have been rooted in the unshakable ground that is the living church. For 2,000 years, we've been marked by our love, our joy, our courage, our service to the needy, and our unmatchable hope in the goodness of God in Christ Jesus. Okay, hang on a second. Greg Locke is telling us that his church is marked by the love and joy that they have for people? Is this a joke? And service to the needy? What service to the needy? I know he gives to people in his church. Does he give to anybody else? What about LGBT groups? Does he help them? And our unmatchable hope in the goodness of God in Christ Jesus? Okay, I suppose. There's a reason that Christian churches dot the landscape all across the free world. Well, I mean, not, not for nothing, but, you know, Muslim churches, mosques, they dot the landscape across the free world also. Churches of all sorts dot the landscape. If he's trying to use that as proof that the Christian church is special, sorry. It's really no different than any other religious group. We as the local church are the beacon of hope to our neighbors and our communities and the lost folks down the street. In a world crippled by fear and uncertainty, hope in Christ is the only true antidote. Wow, that's really interesting because, uh, well, it seems to me if that were the case, okay, let, let me show you this clip from Greg Locke since he mentioned this. This came out early August, 2021. Okay, so this is about a year after he wrote the book that we're reading right now. And this is what he had to say to anybody who wants to wear a mask at his church. Listen to this. We have a big old sign that says, this is a mask-free church. We won't even let you wear a mask on our church campus. We celebrate faith over fear because God's not giving us the spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. So he's not going to allow masks on his church campus, and he celebrates faith over fear, right? That's... Kind of similar to what he just said here. In a world crippled by fear and uncertainty, hope in Christ is the only true antidote. Right, okay? Keep listening. So I said, okay. I said, we're going to have to go ahead and deal with this right now. Since the media is here, since they're trying to shut us down, they need to know that we are both biblical and constitutional. So I said... We so believe in our First Amendment right to gather that if you show up and you impede on our First Amendment right to worship, we going to meet you at the door with our Second Amendment right because we are not closing our church because the government told us to. Well, that's interesting, right? So it seems to me that he refuses to give in to fear, quote unquote. So he re he won't allow masks on his church campus. No fear. Except for the fact that he encourages everybody at his church to carry guns. Why carry guns if you're not living in fear? Why even have them, right? If you aren't afraid of the government, if you aren't afraid of anything or anybody, why even carry guns? As somebody in the chat says... But he's afraid of witches. Exactly. He's afraid of plenty. He just wants to show us how manly he is, I guess, and how not afraid of all this other stuff he is. Scripture reminds us that hope deferred makes the heart sick, Proverbs 13, 12, and that hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who is given to us. How can a pastor in clear conscience before God shut the doors to the hurting, lonely, the burdened, or the hopeless? For a little context, in a previous chapter, he told us about a prophecy that he was given. Basically, in a dream, God gave him a dream where he was standing inside the church. The government shut the power off to the church because he's not supposed to be holding church service or something. It, it, complete nonsense. 
But anyways, there were a bunch of people standing outside asking him if they could come in because they wanted to, whatever, be with Jesus. And he said, I don't know what I'm going to do. Just wait. We're working on getting the power turned back on. And so finally the power comes back on and everybody comes inside and blue flames light up above their heads. And then he interpreted that to mean that God has given him a message that the government's going to persecute him and turn off his power in the end to stop him from meeting and all kinds of other crazy stuff. Anyways, so now that you have that context, hopefully it'll add to what he's saying here. Let's keep reading this. How can a pastor in clear conscience before God shut the doors to the hurting, the lonely, the burdened, or the hopeless? And what of the truly lost who are desperate for answers or ready to give their life to Christ if only someone would meet and pray with them face to face? Go meet and pray with them then. Go meet and pray with them. That's fine. Nobody's telling you you're not allowed to do that. Nobody ever at any point said that. This entire time you've been allowed to go meet with them. The problem is running a mega church with thousands of people and refusing to wear masks or even space the chairs out or meet outside or anything. That's the issue. But no, Greg Locke has to be the persecuted one. Always. Let's be reminded that as pastors, the Lord holds us responsible to love and feed his flock. Right now, his flocks are starving for hope, and so are the lost. Don't deny them. Nobody ever said you had to deny them at any point. Number six. This is the sixth point on his list of seven points for why churches need to completely ignore mandates about lockdowns. They weren't even happening at the time, but whatever. Pastors are called to be bold voices in a confused culture. Okay, this is about as obvious as it gets. Being a bold voice in a confused culture is pretty much the job description for a pastor, and it always has been. While we have plenty of great role models in the New Testament, several of whom we'll meet in just a bit, Jesus is the sole example of how a good shepherd should speak to every situation, and boldness is a prerequisite. When he says bold, he means obnoxious. You don't have to be obnoxious as a pastor. But in Greg Locke's mind, there really is no difference. And he demands that you're obnoxious. If you're not preaching boldly to help your flock navigate through all this confusion, you're probably in the wrong profession. Look at the apostles of the first century church. No pastor can read the book of Acts and come away thinking we should ever bow to the dictates of lawless officials or shrink into silence when fear, confusion, deception, and darkness cover the land. Jesus said, Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost his savor, wherewith shall it be salted my god i hate reading the king james i really prefer niv it is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men matthew 5 13 i honestly don't even understand what was said because it's it's cryptic and weird and confusing let me just look it up in my niv version because it's a lot easier to understand in niv i honestly don't know why people still use the king james version to this day it's really annoying matthew 5 13 says you are the salt of the earth but if the salt loses its saltiness how can it be made salty again it is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot wow that's very different from the quote that he gave us but anyway what good is a pastor who has lost his salt What comes of any believer who's lost his salt? Come on, pastors, I know you realize what Jesus is saying here. Are you really okay with being trampled underfoot by men? Wouldn't you rather get salty and speak out? Jesus also said, okay, so that's not what Jesus was saying. Jesus wasn't saying be an obnoxious asshole. He was saying, what was he saying? Let me just read the verse again and see if I can figure out what the context of that was. Salt and light. You're the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and gives light to everyone in the house. The same way, let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Okay, so it seems to me like the verse that he was talking about, 513 here in Matthew, is saying, make sure that you shine as a, an example of moral purity, basically. It wasn't saying be an asshole. It was saying, show people your good deeds and moral attitude. But Greg Locke, of course, is going to misinterpret the Bible to his own ends. Deeply blasphemous, honestly. Anyway, let's keep reading. Wouldn't you rather get salty and speak out? Jesus also said, this is the next section we read about, you know, being a light to the world, a city on a hill, and letting your good works shine. Are you hiding under a basket, pastor? Come on out and let your light shine before men so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. I know many of you want to speak boldly, but you fear the persecution that may come if you act on it. Be reminded that Jesus said, Fear them not, therefore, for there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed and hid 
that shall not be known. What I tell you in darkness, that ye speak ye in light, and what ye hear in the ear, that... Yeah, so basically... God, I can't stand King James. Basically, he's just saying everything's going to be revealed in the end anyways. There's a distinct difference between what Jesus was very obviously saying here, which is act in a moral way, and what Greg Locke is interpreting it to mean, which is be an asshole. Act in a moral way or be an asshole. Same verses, completely opposite messages. Isn't that fascinating how Greg Locke does that? How it's completely misinterpreted to fit his own ends. That's Greg Locke for you. That's why we got to talk about the guy, because that is who he is fundamentally at his core. That's the kind of thing that the guy does. Okay, so this is number seven. This is a final point on reasons why the church should not go into lockdown. God never makes an exception for the authority of the church, and neither does the law of this land, which is the Constitution of the U.S. Look at every chapter of the New Testament from the Gospel of Matthew to the Book of Revelation, and you won't find a category of Christians that get a pass on obeying all Scripture, regardless of the laws of men, and sometimes in spite of them. Fair enough, you're right. You're absolutely right. If the laws of the land contradict the Bible, if you're a Christian, the Bible says you're supposed to obey the law in the Bible first, right? That's true. Now, I, you should just obey the laws of the land by and large anyways. I don't see why the Bible would ever conflict with the laws of the land in a free society anyway. But aside from that, the Bible never contradicted the laws of the U.S. Never. Not at any point. The laws in the U.S. said that people were expected to meet outside or wear masks inside their church and or space their chairs out six feet and or meet on Zoom instead. That's what the laws said. That's what the lockdown was all about. And here we sit with Greg Locke screaming and complaining and crying that he's being persecuted because he's refusing to follow the laws of the land or the laws of the Bible. You know what the Bible actually says? It commands people to follow the laws of the land up until they contradict the laws of the Bible. So Greg Locke is actually blaspheming and breaking the laws that Jesus set forth by refusing to comply with lockdowns and mask mandates. He is actively breaking biblical standards that Jesus set out by refusing to. Absolutely ridiculous. Flies right over the guy's head. Doesn't care. Look at every chapter of the New Testament from the Gospel of Matthew to the book of Revelation, and you won't find a category of Christians that gets a pass on obeying all Scripture regardless of the laws of men, and sometimes in spite of them. And our authority is established in even stronger terms in the Old Testament. In all things, the children of God are to be the head, not the tail. Okay, I don't see what that has to do with anything. The church is never told to bow to any worldly authority. No, but the church is told to follow the laws of the land. The church is specifically instructed to pay Caesar's things back to Caesar, follow the laws of the land, and all of that stuff. Don't make political waves. The Bible says that. That is what it's about. But Greg Locke's going to completely ignore that verse. The Bible also says, don't judge lest ye be judged, and love your neighbor as yourself. But you know what verse Greg Locke focuses in on instead? The Old Testament verse that's been nullified since Jesus came back about hating gay people. That's the verse Locke focuses on. He could focus on the message from Jesus, the one that is supportive of loving the people around you, the, the valid verse. Instead, he chooses the invalid verse that encourages you to hate others. You see how this is working, right? Locke will pick out verses in the Bible that justify his beliefs, even if they don't fit the situation, and he will completely ignore the ones that invalidate his positions on things. Let's keep reading. The church is never told to bow to any worldly authority. We are a blessing to all, and no faith has proven to be a greater blessing to the world than Christianity. Okay, <laughs> that's interesting. I think I would beg to differ on that. Please let me differ, good sir. Simply disagree. Now, Christianity has done untold amounts of damage to society. Now, sure, people have gotten some good things out of it, but people have gotten good things out of Islam, too. Overall, I think Christianity may be a little bit more destructive, or I'm sorry, I think Islam may be a little more destructive than Christianity, but they, they've both both, you know, been deeply destructive. And those are two of the world's major religions. Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are basically the three biggest religions. I mean, there are others, Buddhism, and, you know, I think Japan practices Shintoism. You know, there are others out there, but these really are the biggest three. So anyway, 
the Judeo-Christian moral code is the bedrock of Western civilization for a good reason. No, no, no to all of that. It is not. Enlightenment values are the bedrock of the moral code of the Western civilization. Letting people do what they want as long as it doesn't hurt anybody else is the idea. My right to swing my fist ends at the tip of your nose. That is the moral bedrock of the Western civilization. But once again, flies right over its head, doesn't care. Doesn't care what history says, doesn't care what the Bible even says, doesn't care what the laws of the land say. Doesn't matter. What matters is what he feels. Feelings are more important to him than facts, obviously. It can be trusted. There is to be no authority over God's word, least of all a lawless group of tyrants who ignore the law of the land while attempting to lord over us and diminish the authority of the Bible in our lives. According to the Constitution, we can gather peacefully wherever we'd like, whenever we'd like, especially if we're a religious organization, so we're doubly protected by the First Amendment. That's not necessarily true. There are actually limits to the First Amendment. For example, the First Amendment is all about freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and things like that. There are limits to all all of these things. Here's a, here's one huge, massive, glaring limit to the First Amendment. You're not allowed to say something if it's an incitement to violence. You are not allowed to regulate religion unless religion is trying to get involved in politics. That's the type of limitation. So if you're literally not allowed to limit speech at all in any way, shape, or form, it causes a complete confusing mess. It causes a paradox. It's like the paradox of intolerance, for example. I'm not gonna get into that right now. Anyways, there are limitations is the point, but he, like, he loves to just ignore those limitations. Why would we abdicate that God-given constitutionally protected right? Wait, does he think that the Constitution was written by God? I thought Mormons only believed that, or mostly Mormons. Weird. In a free land that's a treasured privilege, but the number of nations that honor this privilege is dwindling fast. We are to be peacemakers, not pawns. Peacemakers, you say? Peacemakers. Greg Locke wants to be a peacemaker. Interesting. That's the first time hearing of it. We gather as the church in obedience to God. Let no man tear us apart. When the fearful cite Romans 13 to justify their surrender, they prove a misunderstanding or an outright misappropriation of the scripture. Okay, I'm not sure. Romans 13, 3, I think is what he's talking about. Let me just look that up so we have the context because he's mentioned Romans 13. 13 a couple of times not just in this chapter but previously and i still haven't read it romans 13 3 for rulers hold no terror for those who do right but for those who do wrong do you want to be free from fear of the one in the authority then do what is right and you will be commended for the one in authority is god's servant for your good but if you do wrong be afraid for rulers do not bear the sword for no reason they are God's servants, agents of wrath to bring punishment on the wrongdoer. Wow, that's really interesting. Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities, not only because of possible punishment, but also as a matter of conscience. So basically, God put people into the positions of authority in government. He put them there. And if you disobey them, you're breaking God's commandments and expectations and laws. That's what Romans 13 is all about. Fascinating that he completely ignores that. No, I, I'm sorry. It doesn't completely ignore it. Outright contradicts it. Wow. First of all, it should go without saying that we are never to obey a government that commands us to do something that is sinful according to the Bible. Fair enough. That's correct. Nothing and no one has authority over the Holy Scripture, and God will never contradict his word, nor will he ever give a man permission to ignore his word. Sure, I'm, I'm on board so far. I'm with you. When we do, we do so at our own peril. Second, the Lord ensured Romans 13.3 defines the type of ruler he would have us obey as an authority in our lives. What? Okay, 13.3, I have it here. For rulers hold no terror for those who do right, but for those who do wrong, do you want to be free from fear of the one in authority? Then do what is right and you will be commended. Doesn't say anything about the type of authority you're supposed to follow. What is he talking about here? If an authority works against those who do good rather than those who do evil, they are in effect disqualified. Wow, fascinating. That's a really interesting little loophole that he created for himself. The Bible is pretty clear about Romans 13, 3. There is really no way to misinterpret that, but he found a way. Fascinating. 
So if the so-called rulers are a terror to the church doing good works or practice the type of tyranny that shuts down these good works as we are currently experiencing, or if they praise those who do evil while threatening the church, all against the law of the land, would the Lord ever command us to obey such lawlessness? Well, if that was actually an accurate description of what was happening in this situation, then I suppose that's then I suppose that Locke would be correct in saying not a chance. But it's completely twisted around and warped out of recognition. That is not what's happening in any way. At no point did the government command Christians to do something by law that the Bible explicitly says you're not supposed to do. At no point did that happen. We are called to be peacemakers, not pawns. Jesus alone is Lord, and the lawless have no authority over his church. Next subheading is the bottom line. When it comes to persecution, few knew it better than the apostles and the original body of Christ after the resurrection. Once under the influence of the Holy Spirit, the apostles began gathering crowds and preaching Jesus boldly everywhere they went. Punishing beatings and imprisonments ensued, but the church grew leaps and bounds. Reports of the apostles' miracles were spreading like wildfire when Peter and several of the apostles pulled their first Houdini-like jailbreak with the help of an angel of the Lord, and rather than run away to safety, instead they headed straight back to the temple to start preaching again. How's that for bold? I would call that persistent. When Greg Locke says bold, usually he means asshole, generally speaking. I mean in this context, at the very least. What would you have done if you were in this situation? What would your pastor have done? The apostles were immediately arrested again, and they expected no less. Then they were brought before the high council of the Sanhedrin, the same council that condemned Jesus weeks earlier, and their dialogue addresses the Romans 13 paradox with an absolute mic drop. During the interrogation, the chief priest addresses Peter and the others, saying, I'm going to once again look this up directly because I can't stand the King James Version. Acts 5, 28-29. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said. Yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. Peter and the other apostles replied, We must obey God rather than human beings. The God of our ancestors raised Jesus from the dead, whom you killed by hanging him on a cross. Okay, sure. Yeah, fair enough. That's correct. Yeah, if the government commands you to break a law, uh, a biblical law, don't do it. Fair enough. Except for the fact that the government has never... Not one time in its 250-something year history made a law that directly contradicted what Jesus commanded people to do. Never has that ever happened. I know that for a fact because Jesus wasn't really that specific about which rules you should follow. Love your neighbor as yourself. Don't judge lest ye be judged. I mean, we're talking spiritual matters here. But Greg Locke is obsessed with the idea that he is persecuted. It's obnoxious. We ought to obey God rather than men, ladies and gentlemen. Peter and the boys could hardly have put it more plainly. Has there ever been a more important message at a more important time? Do you think maybe in these last days God expects the same response from his disciples that he got during the first days? The Bible says there's no question about it. See what Locke is doing right now? I mean, that's the end of the chapter. The idea here is that Locke is desperately trying to find a justification to think and do and believe whatever he wants, and he will find the Bible verse to justify it. That is what we just witnessed. We witnessed him contradicting what the Bible said, directly contradicting it, and finding a justification for that contradiction. Dude is ridiculous. Next chapter is chapter 8, If God Be For Us. Stick around for that one. It's going to be fascinating, I'm sure. Let me know if you want to see more of this in the comments.